Oh, hell yeah! My favorite game is finally getting an anime adaptation done. Oh, I can't wait to see all of my favorite shifus in stunning animation. Okay, so the past 10 episodes have been pretty good. I mean, I'm really enjoying it. Then is it? Oh, hang on. Hello? Wait, what? You're telling me that the last two episodes have been delayed for three months for quality control? Son of a bogan. Kia ora everyone and welcome back to a new video. As you saw from the skit that I've cobbled together, I am going to be reviewing an anime series by the name of Azure Lane The Animation. I've actually been wanting to make a video like this covering this show for a long time now, and now I finally have the chance. So grab a seat, get some popcorn, cause this class is in session. As a basic outline for this show, it's essentially alternate World War II with a lot more sci-fi elements added into it. To put it into essence, a foreign enemy known as the Sirens have come to this world and threatened all of humanity. However, due to the discovery of this, the Mental Cube, many of these primary nations were able to develop their ships into Kansen, or Ship Girls. They decide to use these girls to fight off against the sirens, and because of it, they were practically able to win over the day. However, because this is based on World War II, there are ideological differences. Each of the primary camps being the Sakura Empire, the Iron Blood, the Eagle Union, and the Royal Navy, which essentially their counterparts being the Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, the United States, and the United Kingdom. However, there is a fifth party involved in this anime, which doesn't really get a lot of screen time, which is the Dragon Emperor, which is based on China. The anime does take certain elements from the game that it's based on into its lore, but in essence, they are two completely different stories taking place within relatively the same world. Now, most of the community have agreed that this anime is canon as a part of an alternate timeline, because apparently this place is just riddles with timelines. But I don't really see it that way. I see it as something that has continuity to it, but it isn't actually canon. Gotta hate fan wanking. God, I can't believe that's even the term. And the reason that I believe this is to be true is because of the numerous plot points that tend to not really match up. Which segues us into the first part of this analysis. Now, like I said before, this show does take elements from the original game and places it into this whole mess. However, it turns out that it was only a single event by the name of Crimson Echoes. But this event does give some background information as to the personalities of the two carriers, Akagi and Kaga. But the rest of the show does suffer from various different plot points being not really explained. 
and this is all thanks to the works of these two, Motoki Tanaka and Jin Haganea. And if you don't want to take my word for it, then here I go. I present Exhibit A. あの娘、空母か。あんな痩せた体では食いでがないが、獲物は獲物。ええ、苦労でやるぞ。What the fuck? This specific part of the episode actually is a very powerful part for the viewer to see because it's a hooking mechanism to allow us to continue watching the show. But this does come at a price. This specific scene doesn't actually get, well, explained throughout the entire show. And not only that, but this is the only time something like this actually happens in the show. Now, this isn't to say that the game doesn't have many of these references. I mean, this one is a literal Yu-Gi-Oh reference. What I'm essentially trying to suggest is that this specific reference doesn't really fit in with the rest of the game. I mean, we don't really see something like this in the game, so the fact that it's here means that it's just a one-off thing. And considering that this is its own original story, I'm pretty sure the writers had a fairly hard time considering they likely didn't have a large enough, I guess, understanding of what this show essentially is. And this leads me on to my second example. In the entirety of the show, there is no mention of any humans. Like, none. At all. In reality, the closest thing we really do get are these chickens that you're observing helping out in the bay. In reality, I guess you could say that these chickens are supposed to be the stand-in for humans. Though, sadly, these also exist within the game universe. Which really doesn't make a lot of sense. As well as that, these manjus only really act as supporting roles or just basic mechanics. In reality, they aren't commanders. And the game can actually support this claim because the main character, which is supposed to be us, is human. There is evidence of human life, and the show doesn't really acknowledge this. I actually kind of consider this a bit of a failure on their part. Because there is one older counterpart, Contact Collection, that actually does have a representation of their commander, but he doesn't really show himself that often. In the show, humans tend to be propped up as like this being that the Kansens wish to strive to be more like. But because they don't really provide an example of the said humans that they talk about, it's a bit hard to essentially grasp this concept of them trying to be more human. And now, for the characters. Now, let me just say that this show has a plethora of characters that are pulled from the game. Though not all of them, there is definitely a fair few. The problem with this does come from the fact that they introduce these characters far too quickly. I mean, within the first episode, we get a show of at least 50 characters. And let me just say that there is one specific example of how to initially make a character that has no sense in it. Hmm, not that one. That one's currently being decommissioned, though it's having very difficulty with the nuclear reactor. Not that one. That one's a little bit too sci-fi. Not this one. This one seems to be a little bit too British. Ah, 
This is the one that I'm looking for. Though, I might have to slightly tweak it a little. Yes, this does exist. Accept it. So, essentially, this character is based on the aircraft carrier CV-6 USS Enterprise, also known as the Lucky E or the Great Ghost. So, all of you are likely wondering, Hey, Kaylee, why are you complaining about this character? She is one of the most decorated warships in the US Navy. Why are you doing this to her? Well, the reason for this is that I believe the anime doesn't really completely utilize her history in order to create a very good character. She is one of my favorite characters from Azure Lane, and the writing for her in the game is actually really well done. All the show really did was that it just copy and pasted the character, placed it into their setting, and only slightly tweaked her a bit. In essence, she's still the same character. And while she is still the same character that we know and love from the game, the setting sort of makes her out to be, from what I perceive, a 70-year-old man going through his midlife crisis, preaching that war never changes no matter the era. And trust me, that saying gets said a lot in the anime, and it is bloody annoying. In other words, it just really does my head in. Oh, and along with the fact that in the anime, she is literally seen as the Jesus Christ of Kansen. Why do they even do this? And at the end of it all, she really becomes the leader of the base. And honestly, I couldn't even tell what her character arc was. I mean, it's really convoluted. I believe this is where I use the term lost in adaptation, I suppose. But then again, it's not like the enemies were any better. <笑>ええ、これこそ神のお星召しよ。皆さえ感がこれが私たちの求めたオロチの力よ。Though the main antagonists are supposed to be the Sirens, they more or less take a side role. The primary enemy for this show is a ship by the name of Orochi, which is essentially a Diabolus Ex Machina. For those of you who don't know, a Diabolus Ex Machina is essentially the opposite of a Deus Ex Machina. It's Latin for the devil in the machine. Now, I don't really have a problem with a plot device like the Orochi. I mean, one of my favorite shows, Space Battleship Yamato 2202, utilizes a similar sort of weapon, which is the Arc of Destruction. But the difference comes in their execution. In 2202, not only do they have much more time to explain what the Arc of Destruction is, but we also get to see it in action, not just in the beginning, but also in the conclusions. Even in the last episode, it is still destroying all of time and space. 
Sadly, due to Azure Lane only having about 12 episodes and the time skips that are caused between each episode, and the genre clash, it really makes no sense to, well, do something like this. I mean, the ship is a literal floating fortress. If they had this ship operational before the fourth episode, then maybe it would have had a much greater effect on how the story would play out. So what could we do to improve it? Well, I've got a few ideas. First things first, we need to set up a protagonist. Now there are two ways. One, you can focus specifically on a group of ship girls and just follow them throughout the base. Or two, you can focus primarily on the commander. You can give him a backstory and you can send him on either two journeys. Either a journey around the base interacting with them the same as the group of ship girls, or you can make it more meaningful and have him fight against the sirens. But this really comes down to your choice of genre. Now, in the show, it really has a big identity crisis when it comes to genre. Because though it's labeled as military sci-fi, it's also got chunks of comedic slice of life in it. Now, personally, you could either go either or route. But I would advise against trying to combine the two, because it does tend to make it a little bit messy. But if you do plan on utilizing both, then make sure you have one genre that is the primary and then sprinkle in segments of the other genre as sort of a secondary. Now, another thing you'd need to establish if you're going down the military action route is an antagonist, which we have in the Sirens. A way you could do this is if you link the protagonist, the commander, to the Sirens in some form of tragic backstory. Or if you're going with the slice of life route, you could have them as the butt end of a joke. Trust me, that'll actually... And I feel like that would actually work better, because sirens don't really have a cohesive um, reason for fighting humanity. It's more or less buried within lore. And I'm not going through that shit. And lastly comes world building. Now, world building is a little bit difficult, but essentially, because it's based on our own world, a lot of its history would essentially be the same, Right up until about, I'd say, the First World War, when the Sirens would probably get introduced. And then, well, world history essentially goes somewhat according to what it is now, with a few edits, and likely the Great War devolving into a sea war. And I believe that one of the best ways to do so is to introduce our character in a similar way to Darabont's draft of Indiana Jones and the City of Gods. If you want to have a read of that, I'll link down a blog post about it in the description below. Oh boy, here we go. So, the animation was originally licensed to Toho Animation, who have made some really good shows before. However, the actual animation that was done was handled by one of their cohort studios, Bibbery Studios. These guys are essentially new since this was their first standalone anime that they had to work on. But because they're normally acting as support for Toho Animations, they didn't have a lot of experience when it came to working the bulk of it. And trust me when I say, it's fairly obvious where they've cut a few corners. But from what I overheard from a couple of guys, it turns out that the show didn't really have a large budget to begin with. And I wouldn't really blame them. Considering that the game makes a bulk of its money from microtransactions and merchandising, it really does become fairly obvious. And as well as that, it doesn't have a large player base and hasn't been around for very long. I mean, it didn't get a global release until about late 2018. So when it really comes down to it, there's only really one logical option that these guys could have done. And that's to go full DIY! 
Seriously, you have to see some of the animation PVs that Yostar has done for their games. It is legendary. Now, I have to say, the sound design wasn't really too bad. The opening and closing songs are really good. I mean, I used the opening song at the end of the power-up video that I made a while back. But the same can't really be said for the music that was, well, in the show. It was trying a little bit too hard to essentially emanate the music that you'd hear within the game. And it sort of took away from it. Like, they're good, but they're quite forgettable. The same thing can be said about the voice acting. It's really good to hear some of these actresses go all out on the characters that are represented within the game. And many of these actresses have to voice two to three different characters within the same setting. So it really gives a good range of characters. But at the same time, there's an imbalance. The original Japanese voice cast is good, but when you get to the English dub, It's your turn. You good? Hmm. Yeah, it, it really is something. I mean, it's easy to distinguish the characters from their voices, but it tends to get a fair bit easy when it comes to English. Especially considering that, well, the German accents are comical at best and just cringe at worst. Now, I don't really tend to like the English dub, so you'd be better off watching the subbed version anyway. Trust me, it is superior. If you couldn't tell already, I sort of enjoyed the show when it was originally being released, but when that delay hit back in December, it sort of put me off. And then when I watched the last two episodes, it was like, eh. And then when I watched it a second time, I really started to see that there were a lot of flaws that this show had in its production. But I'm just a fanboy of the game, and I'm pretty sure that there are some people out there who do enjoy the show. So, why should you really trust my opinion? Well, you don't really have to. Which is why I got a classmate to waste six hours of his life watching this show, and so I can interview him and get his feedback on it. Okay, so Blake, could you give us a real quick rundown of what you remember from the show? Uh, so what I remember from the show is that there are four, um, like, tribe sort of things. Um, and there's, uh, they're at war, and then two of them are allies. Uh, like Sakura and another one, 
And then the other one is like the ah, I can't remember their names. And then there um I don't remember their name. Sirens or something. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> and all these people are like battleships in human form or something. Um and I remember like these two sisters love each other. Yeah. That's pretty weird. And yeah, that's basically it. Oh, I remember apparently um I can't remember her name, but she was the strongest one inside. Yeah, that's, Enterprise. Yeah, that's fine. Alright, so how did you find the show? Uh at first, like, um on the first episode, like the introduction, like just watching it, it got me like really pumped up for the show when I was getting into it. And then uh this girl, she was running because I thought she was just going to go hop on the ship and then go fight these people. But then suddenly the ship just broke down into these cubes and she became, you know, a fighting beast. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what would you say were some of the weak points from your viewing? Um, at first, I didn't, like, I didn't get it. Yeah. Like, it was really confusing, like, the storyline. It was just confusing yeah, yeah. to me. Um. Other than that, it was fine. All right. So, any strengths that you think stood out? Um, probably the battling parts. They were really, they were quite good. I like those. All right. Would you recommend it to others? Um, probably not to any of my friends. Maybe uh, if I knew people who liked that sort of thing. Probably. Yeah. All right. And would you play the game that the show is based on? Probably not. No. No. I wouldn't play it. All right. And just a bit of a personal question. Out of all the characters that you remember by name, who would you have to say would be your favorite? Probably Enterprise. You know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for being interviewed. No problem. So at the end of it all... This show has a lot of flaws, but it can be enjoyed. Though its broader fitness for purpose has not been realized and its audience very small, it is safe to say that it's not really a good show. But you can watch it at your own peril. Or we can wait until this shithole of a year passes by into January 2021 because Yostar have announced that they will be releasing their new original anime series Azure Lane Slow Ahead which looks to be not only better animated but actually well constructed as well as it will be more focused on slice of life which I think will be awesome to watch. Thanks for sticking around until the end. If you'd like to take a look at some of the resources that I've used, I'll put the links in the description down below. And as always, all the original artworks belong to the subsequent creators. And I guess I'll see you later. Bye bye for now.